good morning to everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to the Auron Ethics Symposium. This is a, uh, an annual event hosted by the True Last College of Business and the School of Accountancy. I am pleased to uh, give you a couple of uh, key facts about the symposium. This is a, uh, an event that is sponsored by Mr. Richard Oren, a 1949 graduate of the University of Missouri. Last year, the University of Missouri honored Mr. Richard Oren with an honorary doctorate uh, conferred by the chancellor. Richard Oren graduated in 1949 uh, after serving in the army uh, and in uh, the war. He is actually our oldest living graduate uh, who is still active and actively involved with the True Last College of Business and the School of Accountancy. Unfortunately, Mr. Oren could not be here today, but he sends you his fondest regards and regrets. But he has promised me that he will be here later this year or early next year to visit with you. And at age 94, uh, I've got to tell you that Mr. Oren is an inspiration to all of us. So having conveyed that message from Mr. Oren, I'd now like to welcome Professor Stephen Mintz from, uh, he's a professor emeritus of accounting at the California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. Uh, he received his doctorate from George Washington University. He is a very well-known researcher in ethics he has published lots of articles, and he's also written a book on accounting ethics, which is currently used in the uh, accounting program in Professor Billy Cunningham's class on accounting ethics. So uh, he has also been very uh, well recognized by the accounting profession and the business world. He recently received the Max Block Distinguished Article Award for Technical Analysis from the CPA Journal. Uh, Dr. Mintz also received the Accounting Exemplar Award from the Public Interest Section of the American Accounting Association in 2015. He also writes ethics blogs under the pseudonym Ethics Sage, uh, which is archived on his website, stephenmintzethics.com. We're very uh, pleased to welcome uh, Professor Mintz and uh, many distinguished visitors and, of course, all of our beloved students. Uh, I obviously will not take the time to recognize everybody, but I do want to uh, thank the True Last College of Business and Dean Vinze and his staff for supporting the symposium. And Steve, I don't think you need any more introductions. We welcome you to Mizzou. And in fact, I'm also pleased to say that Professor Mintz was here uh, 14 years ago, and today marks the 15th anniversary of the Oran Ethics Symposium. We have done it 15 years in a row and Professor Mintz was the second keynote speaker and now the 15th keynote speaker at the Oran Ethics Symposium. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Varun. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Are we good? Okay, great. Well, um, it's a pleasure to be at Mizzou. You've got a great program here, and I'm very impressed by the faculty, and I had a great breakfast with the students, and they seem very, very bright, eager, willing to join the accounting profession. Uh, it's interesting because I've given a lot of presentations before to student groups. I've never seen a turnout like this before unless pizza is being served. <laughs> That's when we get these kinds of turnouts. So thank you for coming. Um, I, I wanted to start off with uh, sort of a question, which is, why do good people sometimes do bad things? I don't know if you ever stopped and thought about that. A lot of the financial frauds and improper actions, they're not done by people who are evil. They're done by people who give in to pressure from higher ups within the organization to compromise their ethical values. They're sometimes done for those working for audit firms because there's peer pressure. Let's say you work for an audit firm and you're working with a team of five people. And one of those members of the team uh, admits that he or she did something wrong or didn't follow an audit procedure. And the five team members are sitting around discussing it, waiting to speak to their supervisor and the question is raised, should we tell the supervisor? And four out of the five say, no, it wasn't that big a deal. 
The supervisor doesn't need to know. But you're sitting there and saying, well, wait a minute. Don't we have an ethical obligation to inform the supervisor and let them do what they want? So there's a lot of peer pressure in that regard. So uh, the other thing that I tell students is when you have an ethical dilemma, whether it's in your life or in your professional life, you need to know how to voice your values. Most people are good. Most people want to do the right thing. But they may not exactly know how to get that point across. So you need to think about what you're doing, uh, reflect on it. Uh, I tell my students a lot when we talk about social media, if you're being bullied on social media, somebody sends you a threatening uh, message and you want to you know, strike right back, before you say something or do something you may regret, I tell my students, com compose what you want to say, send yourself the email, just send it to yourself, sleep on it, wake up in the morning. If you feel the same way, send it. But you may view it a different way. So I like to share that advice as well. Anyway, let's get started. And um, you notice I say, why am I here? Well, obviously, I have the background in ethics, and I like to share my information. You may be interested to know how I got involved in, in ethics. Um, it started off when I took my first job in public accounting, and I worked for a firm called Arthur Young. Now you're all sitting there, at least the accounting students, and saying, what is he talking about? It's Ernst & Young. Well, back in the day, there were the big eight. And they started to merge, and one firm, Arthur Young, merged with the firm Ernst & Winnie, and it became Ernst & Young. And my first day of staff training, they showed us a video. And on the video was a staff accountant, relatively new staff accountant, being questioned by a prosecutor. And you could see the prosecutor saying things like, did you verify this information? Did you ask the right questions? Did you double check? And the staff accountant is sweating. And the point was, they wanted us to know we do not want to put ourselves in that kind of position or the firm. So the point was, always ask questions when you're not sure what's the right answer. Uh, especially when you start off, and it doesn't matter if it's public accounting or any other field. Ask questions of those, those above you to make sure you're not leaving something out. You know, it's said that the only dumb question is the question not asked. So don't be afraid to ask questions if you're not sure what to do. That's part of my message with you today. The accounting profession, don't know why this is, uh, okay, here we go. This is a survey. The accounting profession has a high level of ethics. If you look at this survey, it was done by the Gallup poll. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Gallup poll. And they asked members of the public how they rate the ethics of various professions. And it was rated from very high down to very low. And if you look at the top rated profession for ethics, it's nurses, which has been the case for many, many years. And actually, you look at the top five professions, and they're all what we would say are the helping professions, doctors, pharmacists, nurses, and so on. So where is accounting? If you look at the accounting number, which is highlighted, 39% of the public uh, said they rated accountants high in ethics in honesty, compared to 82% for nurses. And only 51% gave accountants a high score. Now, that may look questionable. You may say, well, why is that? Why aren't accountants number one? Well, I think they should be rated higher, and maybe they are rated higher. But the point is, accounting is a well-respected profession because there's no other business profession higher in terms of ethics. I am a little concerned when I look at these results, and below accountants are auto mechanics with a rating of 32. But that's probably another story. OK, have to have a cartoon in a presentation. So there's mine. And if you look at it, basically what you see 
is a line going up in a stepwise fashion. That's profits. That's what every CEO wants. They want profits to go up like this. It shows there's an increase, a steady increase, and that's great. But all of a sudden, the profit line goes down. Why is that? Because the company becomes ethical. And all of a sudden, they care about the numbers. Now, this was the pattern of earnings in the early 2000s with financial frauds at companies like Enron and WorldCom. And it was because all of a sudden, the information became public that the profits were, were basically overstated. But ethics is required to make sure this type of a result does not occur. Sorry, for some reason this is, uh... okay, now we have it. I wanted to tell you about the ethics requirement within the profession for those of you who are in accounting. Uh, there is a requirement in about eight states now, including my state, California, and Texas, Illinois, Colorado, Nebraska, Maryland, I, those are the ones I remember, that students must take a separate course in accounting ethics or business ethics, depending on the state, in order to be licensed as a CPA. And this is becoming more common. In my state, it's actually a standalone accounting ethics class, as in Texas. So what does that mean for you? Well, if you were to, after you graduate from Mizzou, maybe you want to go to Illinois or Chicago, or you want to go to Dallas and work in Texas, you're going to have to show that you had an accounting ethics class. Well, you have one. It's in the Master of Accountancy program taught by Billy Cunningham. That's a great thing, because the state board in Texas or California is going to look at that uh, syllabus and decide whether the course was acceptable in which case you don't have to take another course to practice accounting in that state. So that's obviously a good thing. All right, so you meet the requirement to actually be licensed. Is that all you need to know about ethics? No. There is a final step to getting your license, which is passing an exam on the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct. And that has to be done in virtually every state. So you've taken your university course, You've passed the AICPA ethics class. Am I done with ethics now? No. Every so often, you have to have continuing education in ethics. And I believe in Missouri, I believe it's two, uh, two hours, if I remember correctly? Six hours every three years. Six hours every three years, or averaging two hours every year. And that would be on the state board rules of conduct, I assume. So three different times you're dealing with ethics just to make sure your knowledge is up to date. That's very important. So you can see that the profession takes ethics very seriously. I don't know if you can see uh, in the back, you probably can, the public watchdog function. The audit profession is the key in accounting, even though there are a lot of consulting services, tax services, and there was a very famous Supreme Court ruling. Uh, I bet, think it was back in the 1960s, I'm going by memory, where the Supreme Court said that the auditors have a public watchdog function. Watch out for the public interest. Make sure investors and creditors are not cheated. And why is that the case? Because most people don't understand financial statements. They don't know how they're put together. They don't know if the company has followed the proper procedures. They rely on the ethics and honesty of the auditors to make sure it's been done in their behalf. So the, this is known as the gatekeeper role of accountants. They are the watchdog of the financial statements and the audit report on behalf of the public. So what do we mean by this public watchdog function? I like to tell my students when I teach ethics, there is what's known as the moral point of view. What does that mean? It means that you have to be willing to put the public interest ahead of the interests of your employer, if you're working for a private company, ahead of the interests of your firm, if you're an auditor, and even ahead of your own personal self-interest. Now, can you imagine that? You're putting your own personal interest behind 
that of the public. So if push comes to shove and you're dealing a situation where financial fraud is occurring, you can't or shouldn't say, gee, I may lose my job if I come forward. You're expected to make that difficult call and put your job on the line in order to do the right thing and protect the public. That's the moral point of view. And as that cartoon I had up before, when profits have been manipulated and it becomes public knowledge, what do you think happens when it becomes public knowledge? The stock price goes down. Of course, Enron is always the classic example. Enron was selling at over $90 a share before information became public that they had been manipulating the profits for a number of years. It wound up being sold for less than a dollar a share. So people were hurt as a result of the auditors not taking the tough positions. Very important to stand by your values. Okay, audit independence is very important, as you all know. And if you look at the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct, which is pretty much the guide for ethics in the profession other than state board rules, the AICPA follows what's known as a conceptual framework for independence, which says that auditors have to evaluate threats against independence. What are the threats? And if there are threats, what safeguards do they have in place to mitigate, reduce, or eliminate those threats? And also, if they cannot reduce the threats to an acceptable level, audit independence is violated. Now, actually, in the revised code, for those of you who are accounting majors, in the revised code, this is expanded beyond independence to integrity, objectivity, ethical conflicts, even acts discreditable to the profession. The revised code said, if these issues are not addressed, by a specific interpretation of a rule, you follow the threats and safeguards approach. So what are these threats? And you can see there are seven. The first is an adverse interest threat. This would be a situation where a CPA takes a position that is adverse to the best interests of the client. Well, how could that possibly happen? How could you be auditing a client and take a position adverse to their interests? It's not very common, but imagine, for example, that an auditor or a member of the firm that's doing the audit is approached to serve as an expert witness to take a position against the client. Can you imagine that? Being the auditor, being asked to serve as an expert witness against the client? Doesn't happen frequently at all, but that would be an, ad an adverse interest threat. Advocacy, that's always an issue in accounting. Uh, do auditors or should auditors serve as advocates for the client's position? Well, tax accountants do exactly that, but auditors should not do that. For example, an auditor or an audit firm should not be in the business of investment banking and underwriting the sales of stock for an audit client. Because when you're the underwriter for the sale of stock, and your financial statements are in the prospectus, and then you're gonna go ahead and audit that company, you are, in a sense, auditing the prospectus and financial statements, and you can't do that and turn around and have an independent audit. So that would be an advocacy threat. Familiarity threat, auditors cannot have certain close personal relationships with the client. I'll get back to that one in a moment. I have specific examples Management participation threat. I mean, an auditor or a member of the CPA firm that does the audit, they can't be the controller of a company and then also audit the financial statements because they'd be auditing at least some of their decisions as controller. Self-interest threat, no direct or indirect financial interest in a client and auditing that client. Self-review threat, you better not do the bookkeeping for the client and then turn around and audit that same client. You're auditing your own work. Undo influence threat, this is where the client threatens the auditor to take away the engagement if they don't go along with the way they want to present the financial statements. You know, clients want to present financial statements that tell their story, 
their spin on the numbers. That's not what's supposed to happen. The auditors have to make sure the statements are conformity with generally accepted accounting principles and so on. So what are these safeguards? Some are established by the profession, such as continuing ethics education. Another one is audit inspections. The uh, PCAOB, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, actually inspects the audits. They select the audits they want to inspect of public companies, and those inspections are sort of a, an internal control in the system. The safeguards provided by the client, these days every client should have an independent audit committee, an internal audit function, a code of ethics, and a hotline to report wrongdoing, oftentimes on an anonymous basis. And top management has to set an ethical tone at the top. And those created by the firm themselves, every firm has their own quality controls to make sure independence and other standards aren't violated. And they also have an engagement review partner who reviews the entire audit engagement and signs off before the report goes public. OK, here are some examples. You know, examples are always good to bring to life some of these things that I'm talking about. So let's look at the first one. I'll read it to you. A senior partner on an audit engagement maintained an improperly close relationship with the client's CFO. Now, interestingly, a different partner on the same engagement team was romantically involved with the client's chief accounting officer. Now, can you imagine that today in our hypersensitive environment? What kind of a violation this is, not only of independence, but common sense. You know, ethics is a lot common sense. Who in their right mind can think that you can have these relationships and then audit the client? Well, that's not the end of it. Here we have a firm was forced to withdraw its audit opinion and withdrew from the audits of two clients after it was disclosed the lead engagement partner provided non-public client information to a third party in exchange for cash and gifts. The two companies, by the way, were Herbalife and Skechers. I won't tell you the audit firm, but those were the two clients. This is your classic insider trading. I mean, as an auditor, obviously, you can't purchase shares of stock in a client because you have non-public information, for example, about a merger and acquisition, where oftentimes the stock price goes high when the public finds out about it. You can't call your brother or your sister or your mother and your father and tip them off about something that's going to happen with respect to the stock of your client, insider trading. Here, a firm was sanctioned by the SEC for lobbying governmental entities on behalf of two of its audit clients. Now imagine this, you're an auditor, your client comes to you and says, listen, we really respect you, we trust you. We need to let you know that Congress is debating new regulations on our industry. If those regulations actually pass, it's gonna hit us hard, not to mention the increased costs of regulation. Will you go to Washington, D.C. and represent our interests before Congress? I don't think so. That's clearly a violation of independence, sort of an advocacy threat. And then this is a very recent one, which I call a bizarre independence violation. This is your head shaker. And some of you may not have heard about this. A firm hired a former staffer at the PCAOB to help the firm determine the target of its audit inspections. The firm asked the staffer whether there were any plans to expect a client of theirs. This is actually a legal case. Now imagine, think about it. A firm knows that a former staffer for the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, which is the regulatory group in auditing, wants to work for one of the big four. So the firm says, let's hire this former PCAOB staffer because he or she 
may be able to tell us which of our audits are going to be inspected by the PCAOB. I mean, that's your classic insider information in a different context. That's actually a legal case now uh, with the PCAOB involved and the accounting firm. So, you know, I, I had to come up with my own name for this one, a new threat. So I called it an interference threat, for lack of a better name. So it stands out from the other threats I mentioned to you. All right, now one of the problems in the accounting profession is commercialism. CPA firms are always looking for new ways to sell services. And for many years, they've been making a lot of money from non-audit services. They provide all sorts of advice and consulting. The problem is, in a lot of these services, you're consulting on transactions which you ultimately will audit. And that violates independence. But there's a lot of pressure within the profession to do this to find new revenue streams. And consulting services tend to be a lot more lucrative than auditing services. I mentioned PCAOB inspections. If we look at relatively recent data, the audit deficiency rates um, on average for all the firms hit a peak of 42% in 2012 and 13. You know, that's pretty high for 42% of the audits inspected to be deficient. But the good news is it's been going down, and it's now down to 30%. But that's a big internal control within the profession. If you know your audit's going to be inspected by a regulatory body, you don't know which one, you're going to be a little bit more careful, as should be the case. OK, what are the problems in the inspection reports? What are the items pointed out where there are deficiencies? Number one, internal controls over financial reporting. Companies don't have good controls in place. Maybe they don't have a hotline. Not every company has a hotline to report anonymous issues. That would be a deficiency in internal controls. Or maybe the company, the firm, is not properly assessing audit risk. Audit risk are the red flags, where there may be a violation of financial reporting. That's another common one. I've found that the most common areas really deal with estimates and judgments. There's so much estimation in accounting and professional judgment. Accountants have to exercise professional skepticism. I know when you start your accounting education, you think everything is black and white. Everything balances. Not so much. There are a lot of judgment areas where the ethics of the accountant or auditor making the judgment is very important. One classic case was with a company, Waste Management. Waste Management had all these expensive trash hauling equipment. And they had huge depreciation charges. And they decided one year that their profits were not high enough. They were under pressure to increase their numbers. So what did they do? They took the useful life, which was 10 years, and made it 20. Well, that's nice. Make the useful life double, redu reduce the expenses, increase the earnings by that amount, by 50%. And that's what they did. Pretty simple situation. The auditors either didn't catch it, didn't care, overlooked it, were pressured, whatever. And that was a major fraud at waste management. OK, some emerging issues. Uh, those of you who have taken auditing will probably know about some, at least. One thing that Sarbanes-Oxley requires, that's, of course, the law that was passed in 2002 following the financial fraud, one thing they require is for the lead engagement partner to rotate off the audit every five years. So I do the audit of XYZ company for five years. I'm in charge. I rotate off. Somebody else replaces me. We get a fresh set of eyes. And you also reduce the possibility of those conflicts occurring. Now, one that has not quite been adopted in the US, although it has been adopted in the European Union and the United Kingdom, is for the actual audit firm to rotate off. And it's usually a 10 to 20 year period. So if Deloitte and Touche 
is auditing a company for 10 years or so. They're off the audit, and KPMG takes over. Well, maybe Deloitte and Touche takes over a KPMG audit, so it's sort of a wash in one sense. But you know, after a while, the firms become too cozy with the client, and it's a good idea to get a fresh look. I personally have a mixed feeling about that. I don't know that it's really needed, because after all, if the ethics are being followed, the fact that you've been there 10 or 20 years may be a good thing, because it takes a while to learn the systems and develop the trust. And that's why the profession did not like very much that particular um, recommendation, the PCAOB, which was never adopted. Another one that was recently resolved is who should sign their name at the bottom of the audit report attesting to the financial statements? Well, right now, the name signed is the name of the firm. So it's going to say uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. It does not say the name of the partner in charge of the audit. Well, maybe that should be the case. Maybe the partner should sign his or her name so everybody in the public knows. Well, PCAOB did not accept that. They said that the best way to handle that was private information. Send us to it, us privately, we'll know about it, but why should we signal out that one partner when there are so many different people involved in an audit? So that too was accepted by the EU and the UK, not in the United States. Wanted to talk uh, briefly about financial statement fraud. And this is in a book written by a professor at Arizona State University, Marianne Jennings. And she identified seven red flags that fraud may be happening. Number one is by far the most common and serious pressure to maintain the numbers. Companies project their earnings. Companies project their earnings for the fourth quarter of 2018. And those projections go public. They're picked up by financial analysts and investors. And you better hit those numbers, because if you fail to meet the estimate you came up with for earnings, that's going to create a problem with the stock market. So there's a lot of pressure to do that. Uh, fear and silence, a fellow named Richard Scrooge, who was the CEO of HealthSouth, actually intimidated, threatened CFOs that if they didn't follow along with what he wanted to do with the financial statements, that they would you know, probably fire them, they'd lose their pension, whatever. Um, Youngin, bigger than life CEO, fellow at uh, Tyco Company, Dennis Kozlowski. This guy was rich, and he flaunted it. He had a dozen different homes in different cities. He owned a yacht. He had expensive artwork. He even had a $5,000 shower curtain in his bathroom that was laced with gold. True story. So what did all the employees at Tyco think? I want to be like Dennis. How am I going to be like Dennis? I'm going to shut up and let Dennis do whatever Dennis wants with the financial statements. Because by being quiet, I gain loyalty with him. True story. Um, weak board of directors, that occurred in virtually every fraud in the early 2000s, where the board of directors are beholden to management for their position, so they go along with what management wants. Um, the culture of the company, uh, cultural conflicts, classic example, Enron. The CFO of Enron, Andy Fastow, he wasn't just the CFO of Enron, but those of you in accounting know, Enron set up these off-balance sheet entities, these special purpose entities that were set up by Enron, did business with Enron in part to hide profits. Well, Andy Fastow, the CFO of Enron, was the managing partner of some of those off-balance sheet entities. How can you be the managing partner of an off-balance sheet entity and the CFO of the main company do business with each other? Uh, whose interests are you really representing? Uh, innovation, like no other, a lot of companies reinvent themselves. And as they reinvent themselves, new problems develop. And the accounting systems have to keep up. And goodness in some areas atones for evil in others. This fellow, Richard Scrushy. He went on trial for financial fraud. I believe, um, I believe the company HealthSouth was located in Mississippi 
or maybe uh, Alabama, I don't recall. But he went on trial, and the allegation was he, he masterminded the fraud. What did he use as his defense? He said, I'm a pillar of this community. I go to church. I set up all these charitable organizations. I set up community programs. Are you going to put me in jail for one oversight? That was his defense, that he had done good things in one area and shouldn't be penalized. Well, here's another chart which indicates how is financial fraud most commonly detected. Number one by far, by tip. That's why you need a hotline. Tip is the most common way of detecting fraud. Well, what about external audits? 3.8% of the frauds were detected by external audit. Well, why are we auditing the company if only 3.8% is detected? Well, you know what the accounting profession has always said is, look, don't expect us to catch fraud. We're not there for that purpose. We're going to do some things. We're going to run some tests. We're going to look at red flag areas. But the audit is not designed to detect fraud. We probably have to be there 24-7, 365 days a year in order to verify every transaction of the company. Well, then you look at what are the most important anti-fraud controls? What's number one? The external audit. So the external audit is the most important anti-fraud control, and it doesn't really detect that many frauds. There appears to be a gap there um, in some respects. All right, I'm going to turn now to non-gap reporting, which is one of the most pressing problems with the profession. So you notice I have up there, what's the score, score of the baseball game? And you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with anything? Well, let's assume I'm your professor. I come into class one day, and I say to you, I want to give you a baseball score from last night. Cardinals 7. That's it. Cardinals 7. Well, you're shaking your head, and you're saying to yourself, what is mince up to now? But after a while, I make the point that what's missing is a comparative number. I mean, what did the other team score? Did they do, have a higher score or a lower score? That, in a nutshell, is the problem about non-GAAP numbers. If you're going to adjust generally accepted accounting principal earnings to some non-acceptable amount, you better disclose the comparative scores. How did you get from point A to point B? Otherwise, those seven runs are meaningless. OK, but I'm not done. I say to you, the score was Cardinal 7, Cubs 5. Everybody applauds. But wait a minute. I then say to you, let's look at how the Cardinals scored seven runs. One of those runs was scored as a result of the pitcher balking with the bases loaded, thereby scoring a run. Well, you know, balks by pitchers are very unusual. They're very infrequent. So why should we count them as part of the Cardinals run? Let's take it out. As you would with non-GAAP earnings, you would take out a GAAP, non-recurring, non-cash items. All right, but I'm not done. So it's Cardinals 6, Cubs 5. I say to you, one of the Cardinals runs was as a result of a hit batter with bases loaded. Now batters get hit from time to time, but with the bases loaded, not that common. It's non-recurring. Let's take it away from the Cardinals score. The score is now 5-5. Well, that can't be. Well, I'm not done. There's more. One of the Cardinals' runs was scored as a result of catcher interference with the bases loaded. If a batter swings and the bat hits the catcher's glove, the batter takes the base. That's non-recurring. That's unusual. Let's take it away from the Cardinals, and they lost to the Cubs 5-4. Sorry about that. But obviously, obviously the point is, if you're comparing numbers, you better know how to compare it. And you better make sure that the numbers are reliable. That's the problem with non-GAAP numbers. 
So most companies now have non-GAAP numbers. What are the most common non-GAAP numbers? Things like adding back non-cash expenses, depreciation, amortization. Imagine with waste management, if you wanted non-GAAP or cash earnings, you'd add back all that excess depreciation. You get to a more reliable number, cash or recurring earnings. Other types of non-GAAP or stock compensation expense would be added back. Restructuring costs, uh, there are a lot of them. And uh, this strange looking chart, which may be difficult to see in the back, which is okay. I'll explain to you the purpose. There was a research study done by some professors in accounting where they looked at social media companies and over a five year period, what were the non-GAAP items they adjusted to GAAP earnings? And when you look at a company like Groupon, which has the largest listing, they added or subtracted 12 items to go from gap to non-gap, 12 items. Some of them are common, depreciation, amortization, maybe gain or loss on disposal of a segment. One of them, I had to shake my head. It was called prepaid marketing write-off. So you paid for some marketing, for some reason, you decided not to continue the marketing, so you wrote it off against earnings as a loss, and then you add it back and say, not a big deal, it's not gonna happen again, maybe so. But the, the thing is, companies can pick and choose what they wanna add back to gap earnings to get the non-gap. Why? Because there are no hard and fast rules. That's part of the problem. Yet, if you look at a company like General Electric, General Electric last year provided non-GAAP earnings per share. What did they do? They provided four different numbers for non-GAAP earnings per share to the public. They said it's 28 cents, no. It's 13 cents, no. It's 19 cents, no. It's 15 cents. What are you supposed to do as an investor? Which is the most reliable? Well. Since I'm mentioning General Electric, you might have read earlier in the week that they fired their CEO, General Electric, after 14 months. Why? He failed to hit the financial earnings targets. GE targeted some profits, didn't get it. CEO's fired. That shows you how serious those things are with the projections. This is from Hewlett Packard, HP. The numbers they showed in this report, they went from 4.6 million in non-GAAP earnings to 6.6 .6 million when they, from GAAP earnings to non-GAAP. They increased their earnings by 50%, simply by adding and subtracting a lot of things. So what's the problem? The problem is there are no standards for what non-GAAP is. Right now, you can do whatever you want within certain limits. So what needs to be done is for the profession to set some standards. This is OK. This is not OK. So the Financial Accounting Standards Board would have to do that. And then there would have to be some auditing standards to verify the information. I think that's on the horizon. I think that's going to occur most probably as footnote disclosure to the financial statements because everything in the footnotes have to be audited. And then the auditor would have to take a look at the non-GAAP amounts. All right, I'm gonna turn to my last section now, which is on whistleblowing. So you know, the classic case is where you're being pressured by management to blow the whistle. Do something that you know is wrong with respect to whatever it is. In our case, we're talking about today financial reporting. I always like to tell my students to be prepared for that meeting where they're being pressured by a superior to go along with improper financial reporting. And usually what happens is the person do, putting the pressure on will cite one of five things for why you should go along with them, why you should just accept it. One, it's expected or standard practice. That's the way things are done around here. Why are you complaining? We've done it for the last 10 years. Next, it's immaterial. 
no harm, no foul, the amount is small. Well, you know, with fraud, it's always material. If fraud's going on, it's a material event. So the amount is not as important as the fact that you might have violated the law, and there's going to be a major lawsuit. Loyalty, you better be loyal to the company and go with the flow. Be a team player. Locus of responsibility. If you're a staff accountant, you're not the one making the final decision. It's at a higher level, so why are you concerned? It's not your name on the line. Of course it is, because you're signing off on something you know is improper. And then the ever popular, it's a one-time request. Just go along this one time, we'll never ask you to do it again. Yeah, right. Once you go along the first time, they kind of got you, don't they? Because if they ask you to go along with something improper or fraud the second time and you decide to say no, uh, what your superior is going to say to you is, nah, you remember last year you went along with it? If you don't go along again, guess what? We're going to make it public that you went along with financial wrongdoing last year. Do you really want that to happen? So once you go along with something that's wrong, you start to slide down the proverbial ethical slippery slope. And it doesn't take very long to hit rock bottom uh, and very difficult to reclaim the moral high road. So the moral of the story is don't take the first step down the ethical slippery slope. Um, real quickly, is whistleblowing moral? You may say to me, of course it's moral. Well, actually, there are some tests to uh, evaluate the morality of whistleblowing. Uh, will the firm's actions do serious harm to others? Yes, whistleblowing is justified. Second, the Whistleblowing Act is justified once you report your concerns up the chain of command. You really have to give people higher than you in the organization a chance to correct what's going on. Otherwise, you know, it's not really fair, is it? You go all the way up the chain of command. You must have documented evidence there's something wrong. I mean, you can't come forward with uncorroborated allegations. You have to have documents to support it. And then finally, you have to feel that you going public will do some good. It'll really correct the wrong. So whistleblowing is really a very serious consideration these days. In fact, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act has a whistleblower protection provision where if an employee is retaliated against, they have 90 days to file a claim with the government about retaliation, and the SEC will come to their defense, or a governmental entity will, if they feel it's valid. The other law is the Dodd-Frank Financial Reform Act. Now, the Dodd-Frank Dodd Financial Reform Act has a financial award for a whistleblower. Imagine. You can blow the whistle on a company's wrongdoing and get a financial award. That's true. The award is 10 to 30 percent of any law lawsuit winnings that the government has. So let's assume that there's a $30 million lawsuit against the company filed by the SEC. SEC is successful. You could get 10 to 30 percent. You could get $3 million to $9 million for being a whistleblower. So a lot of people don't like this provision, they say it's a bounty hunter's award. It doesn't sit quite right. And they also say that there's a confidentiality obligation that auditors have. They shouldn't publicly disclose sensitive information. OK. Uh, let me just go to a few concluding comments, and then we can open it to questions and answers. Uh, what should you do if you believe the financial statements have been misstated? And by the way, this is true about anything in a professional environment. You might be in marketing or finance. Well, the first thing you should do is consider who in the organization you can go to for support. Speak to somebody, a mentor. Get another opinion before you start to report it. Secondly, what is the message if your supervisor and higher-ups don't accept your point of view. Well, if I went to my supervisor and I said, guess what, there's fraud here. I'm convinced. I, I, I know the accounting, it's wrong. So you've reported it to your supervisor and they've said, forget it. 
be quiet. This is the way it is. Well, you have to ask yourself, and as I said, this is true whether you're in accounting and anything else, is this the type of organization you want to work for for the rest of your life? You know, probably not, because they're going to continue to ask you these questions to go along with fraud, and you probably don't fit in with their culture. And finally, what is most important to you in deciding what to report and when? A lot of times, you don't have the luxury of thinking through things completely. So I tell my students, if they're involved with a situation where they're being asked to do something they believe is wrong, ask yourself this question. How would you feel if your decision was on the front page of the local paper tomorrow? Would you be proud to defend it? How would you feel if your spouse, your uh, son or daughter, knew about what you were going to do? Would you be proud of that fact? And finally, always say to yourself, it takes a long time to build a reputation for trust, but not very long to destroy it. If you don't believe me, just think about Lance Armstrong as a case study. And in closing, let your conscience be your guide. We all have an internal clock. Listen to it, act in accordance with it. Never be sorry for something you did not do or you did not say. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. That was an excellent presentation. I have uh, two of our School of Accountancy students, my TA, Kayla, and uh, our special assistant in the School of Accountancy, also Kayla. Could you please come here and get these two microphones, and we'll get the Q&A started. So all you have to do is raise your hand, and we'll have Kayla or Kayla <laughs> come up to you with the questions. You mentioned the AICPA code of conduct earlier. Is there something you would like to see added to the code or verbiage that would enhance the code? Yes, yes. I do have something specific. Um, I know some of you are not accounting students, so you may not be that far along with your education. But in the um, American Institute of CPAs code, which is the profession, uh, the main group in the profession representing CPAs, there are what's known as principles of professional behavior, such as uh, independence, integrity, objectivity, uh, due care, professional skepticism. I would like to add a new principle, which simply says professional behavior, that CPAs are expected to conduct themselves in professional ways. Now, this would link to a separate rule in the Code of Conduct called acts discreditable to the profession. Um, you may not uh, understand this or maybe even believe this, but the personal conduct of a CPA in performing professional services, if there's a violation of, let's say, societal norms, that CPA could be violating this acts discreditable to the profession. Let's say you discriminate in your practice, or you sexually harass somebody who works for you, that's an act discreditable to the profession. You see, it doesn't fit into independence, integrity, and so on. I'd like to see a professional behavior principle to give it more strength that says the CPA must have personal conduct in accord with professional conduct to be considered uh, professionalism, let's say. And that just gives acts discreditable more power, just like independence is a principle, independence is a rule. You'd have acts discreditable as a principle through the professional behavior rule. And I'll tell you, that is done in, on an international level. The International Audit and Assurances Standards Board, I think it's called, they actually have that in their ethics that particular requirement. OK, other questions? Thank you. I want to bring up a whistleblower situation and get your reaction uh, to this. 
uh, Halliburton right. is a case that we looked at uh, in my class. We had a whistleblower who blew the whistle and hung in there through court proceedings for nine years. Right. Uh, in, in looking at the stakeholders in this case, we traditionally look at the stockholders, the investors uh, of a company. Uh, this person decided to blow the whistle. His family suffered uh, throughout this nine-year process, uh, partially because he brought all this home uh, to his family. And when they were interviewed after the fact, uh, his wife said if she had known what they would go through, that she would have said, don't do it. Uh, where does the family fit or other personal issues fit in a decision to blow a whistle uh, and in relation to those other stakeholder uh, considerations? Yeah. Yeah, that's a big problem, right? Doing the right thing is not always easy. Doing the right thing could cost, could cost you your job, your livelihood, your family. Uh, this is true, the accountant involved did go through an eight or nine year ordeal. Uh, amazingly, his wife stood by him, even though she may have said in retrospect, I wish it wasn't done because it did such harm. He lost his job as a result of blowing the whistle and actually spent years just defending himself in courts. Yeah, at the end of the day, you have to live with yourself. You have to look in the mirror and say, I did everything I could do to make things better in this situation. I put it all on the line, but isn't that what it's all about? Can you imagine in society, of all of society, if everybody took the easy way out? There's so much wrongdoing occurring. If people like yourself, the next generation, do not stand up to it and do whatever you can to make things right, you know, you talk about a slippery slope. This is the proverbial slippery slope in life. So I think I know the accountant well. He's a friend of mine. And I think when he reflects, he's happy. He did what he did. He recognizes the suffering. He might have gone about differently. He might have represented himself immediately rather than spend several years with lawyers who he believed didn't care about his case because they didn't want to go against the SEC and the company, which had a lot of political influence. So again, nobody said there's an expression, ethics is easier said than done. And that's true. It's easy to say this is the right thing, whether you're in a group with students and you have peer pressure, or whether you're in a work environment. But to stick by your values, be true to your values, that's another matter. Which is why, in part, I think ethics education is so important. The philosophy of ethics, or logic, or religion, or whatever, should be a requirement. Something in business ethics, uh, corporate governance, something which has an ethics element, then a separate accounting ethics class, and combine it all together. These days, more than ever before, there's heightened pressure all over the place to make things look better than they really are. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mitch, first of all, thank you for an informative talk. Uh, very helpful to go over these concepts. My question was more uh, uh, ethics in a broader sense. Uh, in business schools, ethics is certainly one of the pillars or hallmarks in a business school as we teach our students. Uh, the question I have is, are we teaching ethics or are we teaching legal limits to what we can and cannot do? And what is the difference and how do we make sure that we are actually teaching ethics to our students as opposed to just the legal limits to what acceptable behavior is or not? And sometimes um, I'm told that lawyers teach ethics. And I don't know about that one. You know, following the law and being ethical is a different thing. I've always felt the laws establish minimum standards of behavior, and ethical behavior goes above that because the laws can't always tell you what's right or wrong. You have to use good judgment, common sense. And somehow we have to make that distinction. There's a concept known as ethical legalism, which is where people say, if it's legal, it's ethical. You know, I don't think so. Uh, for example, years and years ago, you know, over 200 years, 200 years ago, 
slavery was legal. I mean, is that an ethical practice? All of us would say no, but it was legal. So legal occurs on one level. Legal tells you what you can and can't.